Okay, so like in a video and a tweet, I teased that I was like working on a Green Day becoming the epitome of what is up my fellow kids slash radiating some some dad rock boomer energy. And a lot of you guys seemed like maybe not a lot of you, but there was enough of you that were vocally interested in this and have been asking for it repeatedly. And first off, I just want to clarify that I love Green Day. I have pretty much like everything up until American Idiot on CD and vinyl. I might not like a lot of their new stuff, but they're, they're still a band that means the world to me. And I'm happy that they're in a position to just do whatever the hell they want in life because they've earned that right and deserve it, even if I don't like all of it. I love you boys. Please don't hate me if you somehow stumble upon this. It's all in good fun. And before we get on to the main video, uh, after my last video about uh, Jake Paul and his uh, financial freedom movement, which is shorthanded to FFM, and I said it sounded like a radio station, a lot of you guys in the chat like told me that apparently it stands for something else. Apparently it's pornography. Well, look, I guess in uh, either FFM situation, whether you're giving Jake all your money or, you know, watching, you know, Someone's getting fucked. Okay, so Green Day. And before a lot of you in the comments get me with the whole like, Green Day can't be boomers, they're Gen X. Boomer is an attitude. Obviously, it's literally an age group, but the okay boomer thing started as just a response to an attitude, a sentiment. It's just the evolution of culture. I do not make the rules of this culture. I just express them. And I don't think they're actually boomers. I just think they're maybe getting a little bit cringe, but that's okay, because I'm very cringe all the time. They're just really channeling this. How do you do, fellow kids? And I'm glad they're having fun, but going to the Green Day Twitter after seeing that billboard ad and seeing a bunch of horny jokes just makes me sad. But we'll get back to that, because first I feel I need to, to clarify some things, and that's why this video <laughs> was not just like a quick, easy one. It's kind of turning into a little bit of a love story to Green Day before we talk about some of the stuff surrounding the current state of Green Day. So as mentioned, I've loved Green Day and I mean, truly love them. Pop punk and punk in general was like the first style of music that I felt like I discovered on my own when I was a kid. I will never be able to thank them enough for getting me through some of the worst moments of my life. And honestly, most of the first songs I learned on guitar as a kid were Green Day songs. And so before I start dunking on them a little bit, I feel like I have to talk about some of the really cool things Green Day has done over the years and the reason why they've managed to kind of like stake out this shell in the world that we're still talking about them. And that even when everyone was calling them sellouts for signing to Warner slash Reprise Records, switching up styles, they're still cool as shit. So before the children of today were even thoughts or accidents in their parents' lives, Green Day pisses off the community that they originated from. Now there is a great video on the Punk Rock NBA channel uh, that goes through this whole stage of of their life really, really intensively. But the basics of the situation is that Green Day pretty much came up through the DIY punk scene and started playing local shows at the iconic venue 924 Gilman Street. They eventually signed to Lookout Records and after two albums with Lookout, they started grabbing the attention of larger labels. And suddenly this larger label attention started getting them negative attention from that same community that they came from, from the people that they had been playing for and alongside for years. This got them the funds to record Dookie and the backing to promote them as a band. So a major thing that I didn't know until I watched the aforementioned punk rock NBA video uh, was that Green Day actually was banned from Gilman after they signed to Warners. But despite that, they ended up buying the venue a new sound system back in 2008. And that's just one of the many situations where they gave back to the same community that kicked them out on their butts because they chose to be sellouts. Now, apparently the ban was officially lifted in 2015 and they also fought Warner so that Lookout would retain the rights to their first two albums, essentially meaning meaning that the bigger Green Day got, the more people would go looking for that back catalog and the better Lookout would do as a label in the long run. And in terms of the aforementioned principles, here's one of my favorite, favorite live moments from Green Day. Here's Billy Joe kicking some douche in the head for purposely trying to hurt people in the crowd. Like, that's what I want from my musicians. You've also got all the iconic moments from like the 94 Woodstock mud fights. The stuff that tends to annoy people who might be trying to watch back a concert, but means everything in the moment of bringing kids on stage to sing, play various instruments. All that shit is cool. So like I mentioned, they kind of continued growing. There was some backlash around warning where people just really weren't a fan of the direction that they went in musically. And after a little bit of, of a break after that, they come out with American Idiot, which just 
transcends worldwide. Which is kind of fun to think about because it almost didn't happen. The album that was originally supposed to release after Warning was called Cigarettes and Valentines and the masters were stolen so they just decided to write an entire new album. Which was the astronomical success American Idiot. And they'd obviously had popular songs before that and got pretty heavy radio play. But American Idiot seemed to strike at the perfect time. A politically driven rock opera during the Bush presidency that was still super fun to listen to. The stars really aligned for that. And then things got a little bit weird. Uh, obviously, this album being so successful catapulted them into a new level of success that they hadn't previously anticipated. American Idiot was turned into a musical and there was even talks of a film discussion. A song off of Trey was used in the Twilight soundtrack. Y'all know how I love my Twilight. And wait, 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 wait. Why didn't anybody tell me that there's a Green Day Beat Saber song pack. Where is my VR headset? <laughs> Anyways, through all that, I think it kind of got hard to go from being the champions of the underdog and the 99%, the life you grew up with, to being shoved into the 1%. Billy's even talked about this with Rolling Stones, stating, I feel like a 99, but technically I'm a one. I know that's where I come from, the 99, even though I can afford for my kids to go to a good college. And this success ended up leading to a couple of public backlashes because they basically entered a nonstop work cycle uh, after the release of 21st Century Breakdown. They were in a constant tour cycle. They were working on new music. It just never really seemed to let up. And there was a lot of anxiety there, uh, particularly for lead singer Billy Joe Arm Armstrong. And one of the most notable moments during this time is obviously the iHeartRadio breakdown. I've been around since 1980 and you're gonna give me one fucking minute? You gotta be fucking kidding me! You fucking kidding me! What the fuck? I'm not Justin Bieber, you motherfuckers! Let me show you what one fucking minute fucking means. God, I love how Trey just stands there. Also on the topic of Justin Bieber, literally everything he did around Yummy is significantly more cringy than anything we're gonna be talking about involving Green Day in my opinion, so there you go. I'm not an expert in modern day boomer culture, but that moment just kind of screams like, I've been around since 1945, so you need to listen to me because I'm more important. We're all going there, so we make fun now, but eventually this will be all of us. But I will say that this crowd really Really sucked. Like a bunch of mom and dads wandered down from the casino and paid for front row tickets so they could just sit there tastefully and say, I saw Rihanna. There's no doubt in my mind that that contributed to the overall just attitude of the, the entire performance. And also having your set cut short because the last artist went too long, I'd be pissed too. I would definitely be pissed and I agree. They, I feel like they've earned more respect than that, even though most of the people there seem to be there for other artists. But even though it's the very end of that set that always gets called out and brought back to, there's some questionable behavior throughout the entire thing. How about you? Okay, I'll, I'll be really naughty on the first day with you. So it ended up coming out later that Armstrong was dealing with pretty significant alcohol abuse issues combined with prescription medication. He had been taking medicine for insomnia and anxiety and was kind of taking way too many of them because he just couldn't keep himself in check. And then obviously combining that with alcohol is just a recipe for disaster, which he's now thankfully kicked after that moment. He was encouraged to go into rehab, though now in 2020, he kind of looks back on it as a super punk rock moment saying, I thought it was more negative than it was. Now I think it was one of the most punk rock moments in the last 10 years. I should have taken it as that instead of a nervous breakdown. I know it gets pretty dark for other people that were involved, like my wife and kids, but it's a, as a piece of theater, it, it was pretty amazing. And yeah, there are a lot of awesome no fucks given moments in that performance, but knowing the reasons behind it, just make it difficult to, to champion. Like that could have been the moment where he catapulted off a cliff and then this video would be having a very different conversation. But during this time, the trio released Uno, Dos, and Tre, which uh, honestly could have been one great album, but ultimately ends up as three albums with a lot of filler. So at this point, the band took a four year break before coming back with Revolution Radio. A lot of people saw this as like the return to Green Day. It didn't quite get there for me, but a lot of people had fun and they really enjoyed it. But finally, now we get to the mother of all, Mother redacted Urs. Now this is really where some of these sentiments of cringe start to seep in. Again, Green Day, I love you. I will attend any concert you put on. I will yell my heart out and cheer. 
we're, we're, we're just having a little bit of fun here today. And I'll clarify that they've not done a single thing during this album cycle that's worthy of extreme hate or criticism. It's just some, it's just some fun. It's not like Yellow Card, who aren't even a band anymore, who are suing Juice World, even though Juice World has passed away. Yikes. This is just some stuff that makes me feel a little bit sad and make this kind of face. Again, I love you. So what specifically prompted this video was the billboard that I alluded to earlier that the band shared and ultimately deleted when they started getting dunked on heavily by the internet. No features, no Swedish songwriters, no track beats, 100% pure uncut rock. Back in my day, we had real music. Is just the energy that I, I feel from that. So uh, there's so much to unpack here. Um, and a massive chunk of the internet collectively cringed at the boomer energy behind this billboard and the ads. I've seen this on magazines, newspapers. I've seen it. It's they committed to this ad. So first off, there might not be features, but there are samples to the point that oh yeah's proceeds are being donated because it sampled a Joan Jett cover of a Gary Glitter song. And there was some shit that people realized about Gary Glitter. So yeah, uh, I don't even know what they're trying to prove by not having any Swedish songwriters. Like I get it, but at the same time, it just, it just seems weird. I know some people were trying to say that all of this felt racist. I'm not gonna go that far. It's not, it's just cringy. Like we don't need to make it bigger than it actually is. It's just, it's just sad. And then I might not listen to trap music, but it's still just so lame to try to prop up this album by shitting on what a ton of other people like. Apparently uh, a lot of this stuff can potentially fall back on Crush Management, who I guess they signed with back in 2017, who seem to push Green Day into an area where they're marketing themselves simultaneously to kids dads and those guys you went to high school with who just got super stuck in their rural ways still saying things like rap is crap and probably get along super well with Nickelback and Five Finger Death Punch is that a was that a little bit too <laughs> is that too specific but the marketing issues I'll try not to hold to the band too extensively I know they have to okay everything but I get that they're not the ones like going out there making the ads and I get that rock music is in a super weird place right now where like half the things that get put on top performing billboard charts for rock music are not rock music at all so to be one of the last major commercially viable rock bands is kind of hard to juggle the marketing, but 100% pure uncut rock is just... No, it's just so cringy. But I guess Billy came up with Horny the Unicorn, which uh, maybe it is in fact I who am channeling the boomer energy because we all respect Dookie, even though it's literally a word for poop, but it just seems like something they created so they could make slightly inappropriate horny jokes while just referring to a mascot. It just really reminds me of like inappropriate dad and uncle jokes. I, I might have to test this and see if my uncle finds this funny. And I say this as somebody who does cringe stuff all the time. We're just having fun here. We're just having a little bit of fun Duncan. And apparently America runs on Duncan, so it's <laughs> so bad. See, I do cringe shit all the time. I say cringe things all the time. We're just having fun here. But this whole album's life cycle has actually been a little bit interesting to the point that Green Day fans thought the whole album was a troll. Specifically a troll to mess with Warner because this is the last contractually obligated album they have for the label. Uh, even though there was no indication that they've ever had issues with Warner because apparently there's no way they would have released something like Father of All seriously. Like I know we don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but why would they make an entire album that intentionally sucked to mess with a record label that they're part ways with anyways while still expecting their fans to pay for it when again their contract's already up. If that was true they'd be super shitty. So you might be wondering why people thought this was a joke album. So other than a lot of people questioning the singles another major reason seemed to be the album cover which I guess fans just thought it seemed like such a lazy mess that there's no way it could be real. The album's also super short clocking in at 29 minutes which just apparently reeked of a lack of effort and now that the album is out there's still people who think the whole thing is a troll and the band's going to release a real album later this year. Now Billy Joe has said that there's more songs that weren't released on this album and they've been working on some other singles, but he said they would probably be released individually as tracks or as a smaller EP. Nothing indicating that Father of All is any kind of troll. And one of the things that really fueled this was that there was a band called Panic Land who ended up taking a fake 
leaked uh, track list and made an entire Green Day mimic album and started leaking various pieces of the projects online, including a fake album cover, studio session video leaks, and full songs that sounded like they could have been Green Day that included some Green Day sampling to really just drive it home. And a ton of people took this super seriously, and there are people to this day that are disappointed that this album is not actually what Green Day released. People really thought that this was a genuine project that was going to be more in the vein of their original sound or their typical sound, and the whole thing was a hoax. I'll link to the video down below because everything they did is super interesting and it's definitely worth watching. And the sheer amount of products that are being made for this album just remove any remote belief that this isn't 100% intentional. The products rival those of what Kiss and the Misfits have their logo on. There's horny stash jars, horny grinders, honk if you're horny bumper stickers, zippo lighters, guitar strap, mugs, pins, air fresheners, baby onesies, socks, t-shirts, hats, hoodies, and long sleeve tees. That's a full product line. This is not a joke. And obviously if the album was amazing, none of this would really matter. It's just a marketing team trying to figure out what to do with rock music in the modern age. But while some of the songs are fun. The album as a whole just feels forgettable to me and it's loaded with a bunch of the stuff that they've been called out for overusing in the past while still not really sounding like them at all. A lot of people are making like the car slash Pepsi commercial comments probably because of some of the like woo woo and, and there's some there's some really really rough lyrics. So some of like some of these songs musically don't really bother me that much but it's like when I really hone in on the lyrics. Let's take a look at uh, I was a teenage teenager for example. I was a teenage teenager, full of piss and vinegar, living like a prisoner for haters. I was a teenage teenager, I'm an alien visitor, my life's a mess, and school is just for suckers. School is for suckers? Oh my god, is that Jake Paul? So yeah, the <laughs> A little bit rough to me, a little bit rough. But again, if you like this album, that's awesome. I'm glad it brings you joy. That's what the world is all about. But a lot of people really hate this. I went into this record praying the big boomer energy radiating off of this billboard were both just ironic. And if it is, let me say this record is maybe one of the most successful attempts at purposefully throwing a big fat turd into the collective lap of your audience. So, are Green Day sliding into the boomer life? Maybe just a bit, but I guess it's kind of hard to be in your 40s to have reached such a high, insane level of success, have a wife, have kids, and still be the same people that you were in your 20s. And I'd still love to hang out with these dudes and use all of the certified Green Day Instagram filter apps with Billy Joe. I'll do it. I'll make fun of it, but I'll do it. My parents do cringy things online all the time, and I still love the hell out of them, and guess what? Green Day are dads on the internet now. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that some of the stuff they do does feel like it's channeling and giving off some significant dad and boomer and what have you cringe energy. <laughs> but the real boomer is the marketing team. Whoever came up with that. That's the real enemy here. And honestly, at the end of the day, even if I'm not a huge fan of their new projects, all the members seem like totally awesome people who love what they do and still have a passion for the music and we should all be so lucky in life. So again, I'm just gonna pull it back to everyone ages, everyone goes through nostalgia, everyone's gonna age out of trends and feel old and get called boomers or oldie by a new generation of kids. And then the same thing is gonna happen to that generation of kids until the entire planet just blows up. That's life. Love what you love. Do do good. Also, someone said they'd hit me if I didn't mention the fact that if you pitch up Billy Joe Armstrong's voice, he sounds like Phineas from Phineas and Ferb. So there you go. Uh, anyways, that's gonna do it for today's video. I don't know what this is anymore. I hope somebody actually enjoyed this. This has gone through many transitions and writing rewrites. So uh, thank you all so much for watching. Have a fantastic day. Thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys rock. And yeah, I hope you all have a fantastic day. And we'll catch you all later.